Family Carer Support. I will ask the clerk to please read the motion. That this assembly recognises the significant impact of COVID-19 on children and adults with a disability and the exceptional contribution of family carers further to the cessation of many statutory and non-statutory services and calls on the Minister of Health to produce a detailed plan for the resumption of services. Thank you. I call Kelly Armstrong to move the motion. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise today to propose this motion. Ms. Armstrong, I'm sorry. I apologise. It's okay. No, no, it's all right. Um, just so people know the, the House rules. Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer, Ms. Armstrong, will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. I now call Kelly Armstrong to open the debate on the motion. Apologies and thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I promise I won't take my full 10 minutes because I know that there's a lot will want to speak on this motion today. I rise to propose this motion not just on behalf of the Alliance Party, but on behalf of a cross party or a cross group of MLAs um, in this place. Um, I would like to thank all those who signed the motion and also to recognise the work of the many volunteers and carers who helped to contribute to the motion. And I'll recognise actually a lot of the members here will know who signed. The work of Chris Little, MLA, who's not speaking today on this motion, who negotiated with quite a few of you in the background. Um, we have come together to recognise the significant impact COVID-19 has had on children and adults with a disability and the exceptional, amazing contribution of family carers throughout lockdown. From the outset, I would like to confirm that this motion has been created with Finney, that's families involved in Northern Ireland, who represent a regional network of carers and family members who provide substantial care on an unpaid basis for disabled adults and children. These carers are part of the rainbow of heroes who have protected and looked after some of our most vulnerable family members, who thankfully have not come into contact with COVID-19. They have kept their loved ones safe, irrespective of the exhaustion and ongoing anxiety throughout the past last 16 weeks. Speaker, one of the key issues with lockdown was the almost immediate withdrawal of many statutory and non-statutory services. And that just happened to show how quickly COVID forced changes upon us. So many people with disabilities and their families rely upon those services. In most cases, these services were removed without warning or consultation with families. These services included day care, respite care, day opportunities and other social care support. Carers took over immediately, providing full-time care and support. And when I say full-time, I don't just mean full-time working hours. I mean 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How do I know this? Because my amazing brother needs this such care. My dad, who's in his mid-70s, he'll not like me saying that, um, has provided full-time care for my brother with only short periods of respite provided by myself and other family members. I know exactly what it is like to live with the fear that carers have. What if their loved one catches COVID? How would they cope in hospital on their own without us? What would happen if I got COVID or my dad got COVID? Who would look after the person then? For many carers, having to deal with the fallout of services being removed so quickly has caused many problems. Breaking routine throws a carer's world into chaos. It is very difficult to explain to a loved one why they are not allowed to go to work or day opportunities or daycare. To watch them become more insular and almost retreating into themselves. To see their independence reduce while at the same time providing all of their care. Every day this means and I'll explain what carers do. They wash the person, they dress them, they help them with their toileting, they prepare their food, they help to feed them, they are their entertainment, they protect the person, they do all the cleaning, they wash all the clothes, they try to maintain good hand hygiene, and that's not easy when the person doesn't want you to touch their hands. And this goes on day after day after day. The only thing that keeps the person going is that there's no one else to do it. They, the person who they're looking after, are your loved one. You will do anything to help them, support them and care for them, even if you are physically exhausted, emotionally drained and haven't slept in perhaps days. We also had school support 
um, provided through or provided such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, and all ceased to be available for children with special education needs and had a severe impact on the health and well-being of families. Not only have parents and carers had to take over full-time care, but also then add to that acting as teachers and providing those interventions that had to disappear. Mr Speaker, Mr Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker and Minister, families need to know when services will resume. Families need to be part of that process. They will need to reintroduce their loved ones to a routine that once was, but also prepare them for the necessary changes, such as face masks, hand washing, social distancing, and that some of their much-loved support staff have gone, reallocated to other necessary services, or unfortunately have been made unemployed. Minister, I'm sure you agree, carers and families should be recognised for their extraordinary effort throughout this crisis. They have worked as hard as any of your medical staff for four months without a break. But there is a solution. I'm not just not coming here to say how terrible everything is. And I hope that I can express the families' wishes in a way that honours their input to this motion. Carers need a detailed plan for the reintroduction of services for the person they care for. Carers need to be part of creating that plan and that planning needs to start now. Indications are that external services will not be restored to meet assessed need for a long time, and this needs to be clarified and shared with family carers, not just about rumours or suggestions. Carers do need clarity. Trusts, it would be really helpful if they could assess the long-term, night and day care that uh, has had, the impact that has had on our carers. If carers go down, if they get sick, our health service cannot cope with taking over the caring duties for the people with disabilities who are cared for and also look after those carers. Carers need emotional support, and while organisations like Finney have enabled carers to talk to each other, many other carers have not been able to speak to anyone, and they remain in isolation. In fact, just before I come in here this, uh, this evening, um, I spoke to RNIB, who have recognised that social isolation and that terrible loneliness that is happening out there. The isolation and sometimes overbearing responsibility carers feel needs to be recognised and supported. We need to care for our carers and ensure investment in local support for them as well. Family carers have asked and they must be given discretion to use individual budgets immediately for, family or for managing their family members' support needs in a way that gives flexibility, choice and control. And I appreciate there may be Department of Communities or Department of Health but to be honest, a lot of the red tape, the barriers, are in place through the trusts. It's time for us to trust our carers and to enable them to purchase support until health is in a position to provide it for them or with them. Carers who work outside the home also need to be protected. A partnership between health, economy and communities could create employment and benefit protections to allow carers to continue to care for their loved ones and not face being sacked, made unemployed or be pushed into poverty because the statutory and non-statutory services are not in place. So it's not just all about health, it is a partnership. Indeed, when considering partnerships, health and education must cooperate to deliver school services and support for children and young people with physical and learning disabilities. But we're here today talking about our carers and with our health minister. Let's not leave carers behind. Let's not leave adults and children with disabilities behind. Being a carer is not all doom and gloom. It is a privilege to look after my family. There are days when there's a lot of laughter and you can see the person that you care for is happy and is coping and life is good. But there are days when it's exhausting, frustrating and intolerable. Family carers have remained quietly behind closed doors in fear, desperation and despair. They have always called on their reserves of resilience to survive the most extreme circumstances driven by the need to stay strong so they can care for those who need us the most. After all, who else can they depend on? Mr Principal Spe Deputy Speaker and Minister, I hope today we can say they can depend on us. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I welcome this motion before the House uh, this evening. There's no doubt that COVID-19 has had a huge impact on those with disability and their families. 
During the pandemic, many services normally accessed by adults and children with disabilities have been either suspended or disrupted as part of the public health response or health protection regulations. And some examples include the suspension of Disability Action Transport Scheme, Shop Mobility, of charitable initiatives carried out by in physical proximity, including counselling, overnight stays, group activities, restrictions on visiting to learning disability units, suspension of off-site visits to family or friends by those in supported living accommodation. The closure of schools has impact on the social and educational outcomes for those with particular needs as well. And I know in my office we have been contacted by many families who are looking to us for help. These are very real concerns. And one very brief example is if care has to be stopped for some reason and the family is able to manage in, in the very short term, will there be guarantees that this care will resume in the future? And that's a big worry. The nature of this threat saw parents having to make emergency care plans for their disabled children in case they become incapacitated. These are steps which no parent or, gar or guardian should ever have to make. Obviously, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, this has a, had a massive impact on mental health. And mental illness is the largest single cause of a disability in Northern Ireland. Better awareness and acceptance of this is needed as a society as we chart the COVID-19 recovery. The measures proposed in the Mental Health Action Plan are a solid foundation. 70% of respondents to the Carers UK April survey in, in Northern Ireland said that providing emotional support to those they care for, including keeping an eye on them and trying to motivate them, um, those with disabilities should not be left behind in discussions on how to tackle the legacy of COVID-19 on mental health resilience. The recovery must be fair and equitable to everyone. The pandemic has also placed into sharp focus the disproportionate risk of mental ill health among unpaid carers. 81% of carers have experienced loneliness as a result of caring, and carers are up to seven times more likely to be lonely than the general population. So we need to look at differently how we can address the risk uh, better moving forward. It is vital that COVID-19 recovery has a safe and central place for adults and children with disabilities, as well as those with caring responsibilities. The phased or incremental basis in which health and social care, community services, leisure facilities or business reopens should not unfairly disadvantage those with existing health conditions or impairments. There should be impact assess assessments, whether formally and indirectly, on those with disabilities when making onward decisions. And equal access must be at the heart of this process. That means proactive and substantive consult consultation with service users, carers and their advocates. It also means regular evaluation of adherence to the wider rights of those with disabilities. Many young people with disabilities are seizing educational and training opportunities, some of which have been suspended for the duration of the crisis. And those opportunities must not be lost, and the prospects of those young people should be prioritised. Another key requirement as we look ahead is maybe something that goes without saying, but it's often not the case. It's about valuing carers. Unpaid carers have played an integral role during the first wave of COVID-19 in preventing our health service from being overwhelmed. That contribution may not have been public facing, but it is just as significant and deserves the same recognition and appreciation. We believe that there is merit in considering a plan to review and potentially raise the level of carers' allowance or provide an alternative discretionary payment to take account of the additional care provided by family members during the pandemic. We know that advocates like Carers NI and families involved NI have been pressing for this, and we would urge ministers to examine the potential for a proportionate and fair system of compensation. We're also conscious that the sacrifice of many carers in assuming additional responsibilities during the crisis may have had implications for their employment status. The government needs to look at more effective means of staying in paid work if they want to. Many charities have called for a plan for long-term social reform and investment in care and support services to give unpaid carers respite. So in conclusion, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, even amidst the upheaval of COVID-19, there are opportunities to be identified and harnessed to improve outcomes moving forward. We want to see the Executive Ministers commissioning thorough research and evaluation into the experiences of carers and those with disabilities during this crisis, as well as the impact of suspended services on their standard of life. This is about effective risk mapping and informed learning for the future. I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. I call Ms Emma Sheeran. No one in this chamber would argue against an equal standard of living for those within society who live with a disability. 
However, it's not enough to simply state that we want to see people with disabilities treated equally. We have to act. We have to put in place the measures which will allow disabled people to live equally. During lockdown, life changed for everyone, but the needs of those who require care remained the same, meaning that it was the carers in most instances that had to adapt. Caring for someone, particularly for, when for a loved one with whom you share a home, is not a job that can be shrugged off and left at the back door in the evening. It is a vocation and something that not all of us are cut out to do. It's worth remembering at this point that care within the home is disproportionately the responsibility of women, and a study carried out by Carers UK in 2019 told us that 69% of female carers in the north of Ireland were unpaid. Of those claiming carers allowance in the north in 2017, 68% were female. The same study demonstrated the financial and emotional impacts of this role, with respondents acknowledging what they miss out on and that they had suffered stress, anxiety and poor mental health as a result of their responsibilities, which are often in addition to work and relationship commitments. Of course, there are also many challenges with direct payment care packages. Families are responsible for an employee, someone who is carrying out the care of their loved one, and so the usual stress of ensuring that their relative is being looked after appropriately can be compounded with worries about sick days or pay slips. This has been magnified in recent times with concerns about the procurement of PPE or the securing of a COVID-19 test. I know from my own experience of working with constituents on these matters that no two cases are ever identical, but the crux of the issue is the same. Everyone wants the best for their loved one. A recent report estimated that some 310,000 people in the North are caring for someone and that over 98,000 people became carers during lockdown. These people are at the heart of today's debate. This pandemic, the consequent lockdown and everything that has gone with it are causes for significant anxiety for us all. For anyone suffering from an illness or living with a disability, the threat of COVID-19 is particularly sinister. As the North went into lockdown, the impact of the sudden closure and withdrawal of services on those who depend upon them is extremely hard to imagine. So too must be the decision to ask a care provider not to come into the home or to decline parts of a care package because of concerns around COVID-19. I know of constituents for whom carers have become part of the family. Relationships build between the carer and the individual and when this arrangement is successful, it becomes an organic, natural, supportive situation. A friendship as opposed to a work arrangement. I know families who avoided submitting a request for a care package because of their fears around coronavirus and have furloughed sons, daughters and siblings who have been stepping into the breach during lockdown. These people have not had a break. They weren't logging in in their pyjamas to work from home or spending furloughed days catching up on Netflix, but providing a service that they in most instances have had no training for. As well as this, the change in routine for those with disabilities is often unsettling and upsetting. The loss of respite services during COVID-19 has been significant. Without respite, families are providing 24-hour, seven days a week care. Obviously a massive commitment, which ultimately can have a hugely negative impact on a person's physical and mental health. Put simply, we all need a break. From a departmental point of view, allowing people to cope unaided for sustained periods of time will lead to a greater draw on resources in the long term. It's vital that as the rebuilding plans for health and social care services are developed further, that the trusts and department don't follow the same bias as occurred with the onset of the lockdown, where social care and carers became second or third in the list of priorities. The plans for resumption need to add value to the lives of our disabled population and to consider the concerns of carers. Carers need certainty on the resumption of statutory and non-statutory services. I know it has been asked of the Minister before, but it is important that this issue is given serious consideration. The current arrangements and restrictions on what is considered care need to be revisited. Given the lockdown, family home care should be given some space to be employed, and what is considered acceptable for care should be relaxed in order to meet the exceptional needs. I commend the motion to the House. Thank you. Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak today 
uh, just two days from Sunday when we celebrated the 72nd birthday of the NHS and so acknowledge the phenomenal work that goes on every day right across the service. In speaking today as well, I wish to pay tribute to the many individuals and families with a disability all across the North who have made such sacrifices during this pandemic and indeed will have helped to save lives. I pay tribute to the many family carers who have given tremendous support and assistance and I pay tribute to all of our healthcare staff who have given up their time, energy and even at times their lives to ensure that this pandemic did not have the biblical impact that was predicted. We need and needed our carers. In the midst of the worst days of the pandemic, what was the response to these local heroes? They gave comfort, they lived and they breathed compassion and they helped to save lives. In March, we saw the pulling of the handbrake on social services for adults and children with disabilities. With little warning, with no consultation or engagement with those that would be most affected, it was gone in the blink of an eye. Essential daycare facilities and respite services were shut down. Support staff and daycare staff were repurposed and transferred along or furloughed. All the while, family carers stepped in to the breach and not only ensured that those with a disability were supported and cared for, but that the further risk of infection of family members was prevented. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, here we stand on Tuesday the 7th of July with the worst of the pandemic behind us and getting ready for a summer ahead. And what position have these local heroes been left in? In the worst day of the pandemic, we let them step up to the plate and protect some of the most vulnerable in our society. And what is their reward? These heroes who worked unfailingly with no conditions attached, regardless of the impact that this would have on their own physical, mental and emotional health, who oftentimes had to leave their own families behind so that they could in turn care for others, how are they being repaid for this? Well, they're not. We are now being told that the indications are such that these services will not be restored to meet assessed need for a very long time and no information is being given, given directly or being shared with the families. Forgive me, I know that sometimes we in South Down feel very isolated and alone when we see moves to repurpose our beloved Down Hospital. It looks though like we're not alone in this when we see the same tough, difficult treatment being handed out to family carers. In some ways, I do fear for the aftermath of the COVID crisis. Lots of people are talking about a new normal. Well, I hope that there is a new one because we can't go back to the old normal. If the old normal meant that you had, could pull essential staff from a local emergency department and then send them to a hospital where they'll not be needed and then tell them to go home and use their leave, then I don't want to see that normal. If the old normal means that you can pull the handbrake on essential social services for adults and children with disabilities, then that's not what we want to see. If the old normal meant that family carers had to put their physical, mental and emotional health on the line to care for others in the worst days of a crisis and not be consulted on the future operation of the service, then we don't want to be part of that new normal. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I know that our health Mr. minister likes to use the term repurposing and it's found a way into our new language. But in this instance, I maybe actually agree with the health minister, although he may not believe it, we need to repurpose our health service and find a new normal. What is the purpose of our health service? It's about the physical, the emotional and mental well-being of everyone, whether you're a patient, a family member or a staff member. Therefore, as part of this repurposing, I urge the health minister to do three things that are entirely within his gift and to do so as quick as we can. One, to put in place flexible funding to be made available to family carers so that they can begin to plan alternative arrangements for care and support for the foreseeable future, and also so that they can get a break themselves and not be burnt out. Two, the department must ensure that family carers are given the discretion to use individual budgets immediately for managing their family members' support needs in a way that gives flexibility, choice and control. And three, family carers must be fully involved in any and all of the future long-term solutions. I don't think that that's asking too much. And in case there's any ambiguity or confusion, I absolutely support the motion today and urge all members to do so as well. Mr. Robbie Butler.
Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I welcome what is the first uh, cross-party motion since the resumption of the Assembly uh, earlier this year, and I recognise the work of Chris Little, the Chair of the All Party Group on Learning Disability, and the work that has went into bringing this uh, motion to the floor tonight. And it's, it's good to be able to talk about a motion about uh, some of the most vulnerable people in our communities and the people that provide the care for them, and often done in a hidden form. I'd also like to recognise the, the works of the All Party Groups on Learning Disability and Disability, who have, in my time over this past four years, been relentless in trying to give a voice to those who are often um, unseen and unheard. Also, within those two All Party Groups, we have the advocates, the carers, the community and voluntary sector, the statutory sector, and the service users being represented. And it's one of the most refreshing platforms to be. Uh, working on as a, a politician in these days. The motion, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, if I could just read it out, if you don't mind, I think it's, it, it's, it's a powerful motion. The motion seeks to recognise the impact of COVID-19. And when we assess the impact of COVID-19 right across our society, those most vulnerable uh, must be at the top of our list, not at the bottom. It recognises the children and adults with a disability and the exceptional contribution of family carers. And I think that's an important word in there because it's often unseen and unheard what family members and close friends do in the provision of care in the unpaid sector. And it also goes on to talk about the temporary withdrawal of statutory and non-statutory services and calls on the Minister to produce a detailed plan for the resumption of services. And I do indeed uh, support the sentiment of the, the motion. Um, I think it's important that we recognise what a carer is. I think it would be a disservice to not uh, peel it back a little bit. And a carer today, in 2020, uh, we now know is, can be a child. It can be an adult, it can be a family member, it can be a friend who gives care to somebody because of their frailty, their disability, their addiction or some other issue. Because that person can't cope, that person provides the lifeline uh, for the individual. And the, the, the thing about being a carer is many times they don't see themselves as carers. Um, they see themselves just as having to fulfill that function because there is no one else. And do you know they're champions, carers are champions. Uh, and we shouldn't be afraid uh, to, to put them on the pedestal where they deserve to be. Whether they fall into that role due to being a parent uh, or, or a child or a sibling, we need to recognise um, what they do and the value of that for the person uh, who needs that care. And it's very likely that most of us may perform that function as my uh, colleague Kelly Armstrong has eloquently put today and has done so many times. And that brings a real level of reality to what we are talking about. I looked at a report, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, about the things, maybe the, the, the four top things that, that, that carers have been exposed to over uh, this COVID pandemic. And some of them existed before, but they've been compounded and magnified by COVID. One of them is visibility. Is the doors have been closed, and perhaps it's been even harder to get out and to interact with other people and to certainly to avail of services. The next was isolation. And isolation has been right across uh, all facets of our society. But for those who were already isolated, perhaps it's even worse. Access. Well, that's what we're talking about today, because for the protection of the carer and those that needed the care, some of those services have been restricted or stopped, and that is to prevent them from an even more insidious danger. And then grief and loss. Now, if you are a carer, and especially with someone with complex needs, that is a never constant companion and a dark companion for fear of loss of that person. That is a burden that is hard to bear, which has been exacerbated by COVID. But I would just like to, to, to put on note that I did write to the Health Minister on the 24th of May on this very topic. And I asked several questions in respect of the impact of COVID and what the impact was on carers. And I was delighted to hear that the department was committed to working closely with the carer representative bodies and was cognizant of the Carer UK report carrying behind closed doors forgotten families in the coronavirus outbreak. And that guidance was published on the 10th of April and the 22nd of May. And uh, it was also good to note uh, that mental health got a significant mention uh, and, and there were, was information uh, provided specifically with regard to that. 
Uh, I would just like to put on record as I come to the end of my five minutes, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that it's with delight that I speak on this subject and support the motion. Thank you. I call Mr. Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. It is estimated that up to 310,000 people in Northern Ireland may be providing unpaid care to a family member or loved one, with over 30 per cent of those 98,000 becoming carers since the COVID-19 outbreak began. Many of these carers will be supporting loved ones who have an incurable health condition who are, are at the end of life. Because of COVID-19, social services for adults and children with disabilities were withdrawn in late March without warning or consultation with family carers due to lockdown. Paid support staff, including daycare workers, were reallocated to other services or furloughed, and facilities for daycare, respite and other services were shut down. And family carers stepped in 16 weeks ago to provide all support and care and have kept families members free from infection. It is sadly the case that some terminally ill people have died since the COVID-19 outbreak began. NISRA have recorded 17, 716 excess deaths in the year to 19th of June, meaning that there have been around an estimated 3,580 people, more people affected by bereavement than at the same point in 2019 many of whom were likely to have been providing care to their loved ones before they died. Before the outbreak began, capacity issues meant that demand for bereavement support was significantly outstripping supply, and this pressure is only likely to have grown as a result of the increase in deaths and disruption to services due to social distancing and other lockdown measures. Providing care for a dying loved one can also be an all-consuming rule. It leaves carers with little or no time to recharge their batteries, spend time with friends and family, and even do the basic things that most people take care for granted, like getting a proper night's sleep or enjoying a meal. Access to respite and other support services therefore provide a lifeline for carers of terminally ill people, and this is indeed now in the context of COVID-19 more than ever. The reduction and closure of care and support services and disruption to services from paid care workers will only have exacerbated these issues. Indeed, survey data shows that 44% of carers in Northern Ireland are providing more care than before the outbreak began because of the reduction or closure of support services. For many carers, the outbreak will be an even lonelier and isolating experience as they are cut off from wider social support networks and relevant services. Access to regular respite is critical to allowing carers to take a break from their caring roles, recharge their batteries and look after their own health and well-being. It must be recognised that while COVID-19 has served to intensify the burden on local carers, pressures on the services which support them long predate the outbreak. For instance, the widely acknowledged financial pressures facing adult social care has often meant a reduction in the services available to patients and carers who support them. A significant increase in funding levels will be needed to allow health and social care trusts to rebuild after the crisis, as well as bringing forward plans for the long-term reform of adult social care. Identifying carers as a priority group requires emotional support services and develop an agreed pathway for them to access uh, interventions such as psychological talking therapies. Work in partnership with third sector organisations, providing advocacy and other key support services to care. Family carers need flexible funding to make availability to them urgently so that they can begin to plan alternative arrangements for care and support for the foreseeable future and get a break themselves. Carers must be given the discretion to use individual budgets immediately for managing their family members' support needs in a way that gives flexibility, choice and control. Indications are that external services will not be uh, restored to meet excess need for a very long time, although no information about this is being directly shared with family carers. Family carers must also be fully involved in all future long-term solutions. The Minister has published the Strategic Framework for Rebuilding Health and Social Care Services, which I welcome and support. As part of the rebuilding programme, trusts have also produced and published plans for scaling up services. These plans are now essential they must be escalated and we must ramp up service delivery, especially for children and adults with a disability, and fully recognise and support the exceptional contribution of family carers and into the future. 
We owe them a debt of gratitude, which must be by supporting them now. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Speaker, um, I will be fully supporting this motion and very much welcome the opportunity to speak this afternoon and hope that the cross-party nature will send a strong message to those parents and family members watching in or hearing reports of our discussion today and know how much we care about this subject matter. I would first like to start off by acknowledging how difficult the lockdown has been for families where one of their loved ones lives with a learning difficulty or physical, physical disability. I have said many times in this chamber that the lockdown measures introduced to minimise the spread of the coronavirus had been and continue to be felt disproportionately by certain sections of society, not least this one. We have all been contacted um, during the last four months by people to raise concerns about aspects of accessing health care, social care and education. And I think one of the earliest contacts I received was from a worker in a daycare centre here for adults here in Belfast, who was very concerned about the close proximity of attendees on the buses and in the activity rooms and the lack of hygiene control measures and probably from this person's perspective, the apparent lack of urgency to close operations to stop the spread of the infection. Very quickly thereafter, they were all closed. However, we all need to recognise now that this decision, like many others, likes it um, at the very start, were not taken lightly and were reached with consideration for the full ramifications of ceasing such services. Because let us not forget, back in February and March, we were facing into the unknown. Figures of potential projected deaths were in the thousands, and none of us had a crystal ball to know how the virus would spread. But from the start, one group of people who were acutely focused on the news and the latest information about the virus were the parents and partners of those people who live with health vulnerabilities. Their principal job in life is to care for their loved ones and to protect them from harm. And so when the statutory and non-statutory services were closed, it was done so without that much dispute, but with a sense of apprehension about how life would be for them as 24-hour carers, without outside help and without interventions of allied health professionals and other support staff who play such a vital role in working with people on mental and physical health and development. And so at this point, I would like to pick up on the huge efforts of the teaching staff in the special needs schools and the physiotherapists and speech and language therapists, classroom assistants and so on, who have come up with inventive ways of continuing contact with the children and adults to encourage them to keep doing their activities, their exercises and learning at home during these periods of isolation. I am sure that the parents and carers have really appreciated their ongoing support. I would ever, however like to express some disappointment that it took so long for the guidance for social workers um, working with such families to be reviewed and updated by the Department of Health. I think it was about 12 weeks into the pandemic that that um, updated guidance came out. I had been contacted by parents who were acutely aware that because outside carers were no longer coming into the home due to their legitimate fears over bringing in the infection, that they were becoming reliant on their other children for support, essentially making them unpaid carers. Many told me of their acute stress and guilt at this, especially as their children were also feeling pressure from their own absence from school and homework coming through, and then their own isolation from their friends and outside activities. I raised this issue with the Health Minister on two occasions at the Health Committee and he came back to me with the answers I was looking for. I was asking him principally about the potential for parents to be able to use their direct payments flexibly as is the case in England. And so when the long-awaited guidance came out, um, there was provision in that that the social workers could work with families on a case-by-case -case basis. But also it, it required that the recipient of this money would have to pay tax and insurance and become an employee effectively of their parents. All of this smacks of extra work and stress at a time when there was already a bucket load of both for the parent and the social worker. And in preparation for today's debate, I had a quick look at the comments on my Facebook page about posts I created during the pandemic to provide update for carers. And one post jumped out at me, which stated, no shock there, we're always at the bottom of the agenda. 
Minister, fellow MLAs, we have talked much over the last few weeks about resetting our health and social care sector, better recognising the unnamed yet diligent members of our society who played a vital role in holding the country together during this lockdown. As such, we owe it to the carers and their loved ones that disability services are better resourced and better meet the needs of our children and adults going forward. And in, do, in so doing, we have to ensure that we listen and ga engage and do better going forward. Thank you. Call Ms. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and for the opportunity to sign and speak on this motion today. As other members have said, it is estimated that up to 310,000 people in Northern Ireland may be providing unpaid care to a family member or loved one, and a significant amount of people have become carers since the outbreak of COVID. Because of COVID, many families have had to make hard decisions on whether or not they wish to continue with some of the care that they had coming into the house to consider their safety, to keep family members free from infection, and face the closure of community, domiciliary and statutory support services. The effect on children and adults with a disability and the impact on family carers cannot therefore be underestimated. This Assembly must recognise this and actually do something to help ease the pressure and burden that exists. Local care and support services were closed and health regulations have meant that a number of key supports that some were able to access have been removed, and, and including day opportunities and short breaks for respite which are crucial for health and wellbeing. Members will have received briefings from Feeney, the RNIB and the Coalition of Carers in response to this motion, giving their support for it and further recommendations. And I hope that the Health Minister and other Ministers will take their points on board and commit to meet with all of these groups that have come forward with ideas. I also implore the Minister to continue to engage with the sector, commit to actual co-design and truly listen to the voices of those who are supporting our most vulnerable and to build back a better system that is supportive of our carers and those they care for. The organisations that have contacted us are clear. They wish to be fully involved in long-term future solutions and work in actual partnership, not just being part of any tick box consultation. Additional funding and flexible finances must also be looked at in the short term for those who need to plan alternative arrangements for care and support, and also to alleviate the pressures faced and for trusts to rebuild and deal with the long-term issues facing the social care sector that predated COVID. I spoke to Feeney yesterday and heard the stories and experiences of those women from before COVID and during this time. And it was a very emotional conversation where the realities of their lives were discussed. And I have to thank them for their honesty and openness in engaging with me. What was loud and clear is that they need to be heard. They have ideas, they have solutions to problems, but many feel that they are not being listened to. They need the support and it must meet the needs of their family members and to them as carers. They talked about the level of support they've received through this time. Some said none, one or maybe two phone calls in 14 weeks from the statutory bodies. I don't really think that's good enough. They tell of day centres being used as storage units with no firm reopening date and their daycare hours that they, they need being reassessed and reduced. They talk of inconsistencies between trusts and inflexibility of individual budgets. They talk of the reassessment process for daycare being redone and not on a needs basis. So I'd like to ask the Minister to confirm how assessment for future access to day centres and daycare is being done, that those people that need it most and the more care are able to available of it. Any future detailed plan should include investing and advancing plans for the upgrades of day centres, for example, to ensure our buildings are suitable, like in my own constituency at Rivara Training Centre in Bangor, where parents and carers have been lobbying for years for upgrades and a new centre, despite, despite business cases being submitted as far back as 2012, they are still waiting. To conclude, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, unpaid carers are vital to keep vulnerable people safe, yet many fear that continuing 24-7 care will lead them to burnout. There are many people in Northern Ireland performing a caring role in difficult circumstances during COVID and before, alongside trying to hold down full-time jobs, family responsibilities, their own mental and physical health. And we know before the outbreak of COVID, social care services were already in short supply, and those families with support met a high threshold to get any form of care outside the home. Now some of these services have disappeared, and unpaid carers are having to cope alone, adding to the burden and pressure felt. And the Minister has recently rightly stated that Northern Ireland faces a massive challenge rebuilding health and social care in the wake of the first COVID-19 wave. We had a challenge before COVID and we face an even bigger one now. And part of this is facing and dealing with those issues that existed. 
but we have an opportunity here to build back better, to refocus and do things differently, better than we did before. So I commend the motion to the House. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the members for uh, bringing this uh, motion today. I'm happy to have uh, signed it and supported it. Uh, I want to thank all the curers uh, in my constituency across the north as well, who have been working very hard and extra hard throughout this pandemic. And I want to thank those organisations uh, a lot uh, who contacted myself and other members ahead of this debate. Um, I think it was ne the necessary, necessary need to um, implement lockdown. And Mr Deputy Speaker exposed how reliant we are on care workers, uh, those who work in a broad range of environments to support people with disabilities and current needs, and those who provide care generally, including uh, family members. And it was obviously not just that the trust uh, services were withdrawn, but also a range of, uh, broad range of important community settings and services were no longer open due to the lockdown. Uh, the current arrangement highlights the need for respite care, as we have heard already, for the families who have loved ones with current needs. Uh, the truth is uh, that it is unpaid carers who took up the mantle. Uh, family members stepped in and stepped up uh, to provide care to their family members when it was required. I think we should recognise this fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, and recognise, as we have heard uh, already, it is mostly women who carry out uh, this work uh, in society, and I think they deserve not only praise uh, and thanks, but also some form of financial assistance and payment to recognise that. And there is a call for family carers grants. I think uh, that uh, should be welcomed uh, broadly uh, by, by the House, uh, in my view. Um, family carers must be given the, the discretion as well to use individual budgets immediately for managing their family members' support needs uh, in a way that gives flexibility, choice, and control uh, as well. And when uh, it's um, and no doubt it is the case that care workers and those employed by the Trust or whomever work hard and do provide essential support. We should say that there was a gap beforehand in the care uh, before this crisis, and those unpaid carers who we were talking about and thinking today were often the ones who uh, stepped in uh, themselves. And families uh, involved in I uh, have mentioned that um, in a week of 168 hours, the state only provides 30 hours uh, of support for people, which is far too low. Uh, and we've heard obviously about the fact that there's over 310. Uh, 100,000 people uh, providing unpaid care, a staggering and a massive figure that needs tackled. People need support. Uh, the matter of no return, obviously, to, to, uh, to normal has been echoed loud and clear throughout this pandemic, and we cannot return to a situation uh, where the state fails to provide enough hours to families and people with current needs. And we have heard um, in our correspondence, Mr Deputy Speaker, about carers in their 70s and 80s uh, who have had to provide round-the-clock care. And I, I can only imagine how difficult and tough that has been for them to care for people they love on a consistent 24-7 uh, uh, hour basis, uh, and often without any respite uh, at all. Um, we have to recognise the role paid, uh, played by these people. Uh, they have been integral in providing services when they were uh, withdrawn. Uh, family carers um, stepped in 16 weeks ago to provide um, support and care, and they have uh, they've, they've done essential work throughout that uh, situation. Uh, throughout that uh, period. I think also we have to recognise people with disabilities have you know, generally been overlooked in society in relation to decisions being made. Um, and I think uh, one group in particular, Mr Deputy Speaker, that are often overlooked is people uh, with, uh, who are blind or who have uh, visual uh, impairment issues. There is an estimate of 55,600 uh, of them in our society today. And obviously, social distancing is very difficult for them to carry out. So I think any um, plans for moving forward needs to bear these people uh, in mind. Uh, people who are blind or partially uh, sighted have been shouted at on the street because they aren't abiding by socially distant measures. So we need to bear that uh, in mind uh, as well. And also, just in conclusion, I think we have to remember that uh, many family uh, <coughs> family carers are, are facing burnout. Um, and we have to recognise that we need to act accordingly to support them uh, at this time. And many people have obviously clapped for the NHS uh, in the last few weeks. And in a situation where we're facing economic ruin and recession, I think what better way to preempt that than start employing and recruiting more carers to provide jobs, obviously, but also extra hours that's needed for people uh, throughout this uh, and after this crisis. So, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. 
I now call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, to respond to the comments that have, made in the, have been made, and the Minister will have 15 minutes. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank everyone for coming today and for those who, who brought the motion. Um, this motion provides an opportunity to highlight and debate an important subject, and it is the impact the COVID-19 pandemic has had to date on our children and adults who have a disability, but those as well, those who care for them. I would like to begin with a simple but heartfelt thank you, because it would be remiss of me to do anything other than express my sincere gratitude to the many families who in the last few months have played such a significant part in keeping their loved ones safe during this very difficult time, because it is difficult to overstate uh, the debt that we, we owe to them. Controlling the spread of the virus has rightly been our collective top priority and will remain so as we continue the process of easing restrictions. However, I am I'm personally aware of the very real challenges and difficulties, many of which have been echoed here today, that lockdown has presented for our families and carers of those with disabilities and complex medical conditions. I want to publicly thank each and every one of those families today and assure them that they and their loved ones have not been forgotten. There is, however, much we need to consider, as evident from our debate today. As I have said on many occasions now, this pandemic has changed all our lives, and this is particularly so for our families, including those with disabilities. I am acutely aware that many have faced either long separation from their loved ones being cared for in a setting outside the family home, or the taking on of caring duties on a full-time basis because of the scaling back of services of the closure of schools. According to a recent report that a number of, many, number of members have mentioned, nearly 100,000 new carers in Northern Ireland were added uh, to the list as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic meaning that they are now potentially well in the excess of 300,000 carers currently in Northern Ireland. That is a significant number of people who we rely on to help the people they care for live at home. In turn, carers rely on our health sector to support them in their caring roles, because, as some have said, it is a partnership. One of many lessons of, of this pandemic, however, is that, as an executive, we need to work on strengthening this partnership. My department, the board and the HSE trusts have worked tirelessly to provide what help and support they could under extreme circumstances, and I thank them for their effort, efforts. Recently, we all had the opportunity to celebrate the role carers undertake during Carers Week. This year's theme was about making care visible. I think it's one of the things that Mr Butler referred to as one of the four main challenges. A report on the state of caring was launched by, Car by Carers Week and it makes for sober reading. The challenges and anxieties faced by carers are very real. The impact on their relationships and finances, feelings of isolation, of being overwhelmed and undervalued. I have therefore asked my officials to reflect on the findings in the report and to report back to me on it. Because there is no doubt that the toll that the pandemic has taken on our carers is tangible. Based on what has come across my desk and other members, and has again been articulated here today by members advocating on behalf of these families and of themselves. In particular, I have been struck by the real sense of what can only be described as fear experienced by some of these families as they have struggled to cope with the circumstances that they have found themselves in and the deep anxiety felt for their own health and well-being and that of their children during this difficult time and into the future. I know there is a deep concern among Assembly member colleagues about this, which I share and am fully committed to addressing, building on the detailed work that is well underway around the resumption of services. In regard to closure of HSE, HSE day centres and schools, as many of you have already referred to, we saw the standing down early of most of our centre-based day services and some short break facilities across all trusts. 
in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. While cognizant of the degree to which many families rely on these supports on a daily basis, it is also important to note that this action was considered necessary at that time to minimise the transmission of the virus among adults with learning disabilities and to ensure adherence to public health guidance. We also saw the closure of schools, including our special schools. In response, members will be aware that across Northern Ireland, as anxiety among families and carers struggling to cope at home has increased, all trusts put in place measures involving the redeployment of their day centre staff to provide alternative day short break supports to families on a risk assessed basis and in accordance with COVID-19 guidelines. In many cases, this involved bespoke arrangements being put in place to meet the individual needs of those families, with some very laudable effort made to both reach out to service users and their families and provide in-reach services and day centres on an exceptional basis and adhering to public health guidance. I know that this support provided much needed respite for some families and is worth acknowledging here today. I would also want to take this opportunity to commend those working in the voluntary and community sector for the huge efforts that they made and continue to make to support their clients and families at this time. The work being done at the grassroots by many organisations that have gone the extra mile and beyond is truly humbling. And I think you know, organisations like Compass Advocacy Network in my own constituency who reached out and gave us an update as to the steps that they had took to support their service users. It also provides hope for us all that many organisations stood up and supported those families when they needed it as well. But it also provides hope for us all that some good might come out of this pandemic in terms of learning that can be applied as we now plan for and seek to rebuild services for the future. Many members have referenced the cross-departmental interagency working because this, I believe, is particularly true for our disability sector. I say this because one of the positive things to have emerged from the many challenges that the pandemic has presented has been the even closer working we are now witnessing between health, education and communities. Because this can only be a good thing and has come about through the establishment of a joint health and education oversight group and local multidisciplinary panels in trusts to help deliver an integrated support group programme for children with complex needs and families in greatest need. Working together, children who rely on the routine and familiarity of school as a vital coping mechanism have been identified and placed in our special schools during this period as a result of guidance developed and training provided by our health professionals. Because this collaborative working between health and education is continuing and will inform the planning of the educational restart programme, including the health supports required for children in line with their statement of educational need. Collaboration with colleagues in the Department of Communities and the Housing Executive has increased to ensure that supported living services can continue to reach the most vulnerable in our society during this pandemic. And during the course of, this, of, of the pandemic, we have also collated and produced a range of guidance products and format, formats accessible to those with sensory and learning disabilities. These include resources and materials from a variety of sources targeted at helping people with learning disability and autism and their family and how their families cope with lockdown. And these are available on the PHA website. I've also made additional funding available to Carers NI so that they can extend the operating hours of their advice line service. And in response to requests from carers, a carer's ID card has also been developed and distributed to assist carers with their in-store supermarket shopping. Officials are also working with carers on the health and social care sector to develop guidance which will bring much needed clarity to the complex subject of direct payments, which members have mentioned here today. Trusts have been contacting carers and offering additional support where possible. Online stress management classes, care support groups and health and wellbeing sessions have been organised to support carers through these difficult times. My department group produced advice for unpaid and family carers, including young carers, which was published initially on the 10th of April and has been updated regularly since then. 
This advice gathers together a width of guidance and help from across government, health and social care, and other verified sources, making it an essential one-stop shop for busy carers. My department has amended and produced updated guidance on other issues, including the course of the pandemic, to reflect the specific needs of people with disabilities and their families, as our awareness of the impacts of the restrictions has, has increased. Travel for exercise and visiting guidance are two examples of this. Many organisations contacted us seeking clarification on the rules around exercise where there is an agreed need, perhaps requiring travel to a particular place more than once a day outside of a person's local area. We, took into, we looked into this immediately and updated guidance was subsequently published and implemented across all trusts. And following direct engagement with carers from a range of trusts facilitated by families involved in I, we were also able to ensure that their concerns about being able to accompany their loved ones into hospital were addressed in the latest regional visiting guidance that I published last week. And I very much hope that this example of co-production in action can be built upon moving for forward. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, members have referred to the recovery and reset plans. And this would be a good point at which to address the second part of the motion we are here to debate today, that I produce a detailed plan for the resumption of services. I am pleased to report to members that detailed planning is already underway across Northern Ireland for the resumption of services. And let me make it clear. I have made it clear that I want services recommenced as quickly as it is safe to do so. At the beginning of June, I published an overarching strategic framework for that mammoth task, the task that we are now facing to rebuild our health and social care services as we emerge from this initial peak of the first COVID-19 surge. In doing so, I have made clear that we cannot look too far ahead, nor ignore the huge strategic challenges facing the system pre-COVID that had been compounded further by the pandemic. As I have said previously, the process of rebuilding will therefore be on an incremental basis. And it is in this context that, under the auspices of the strategic framework, plans have been developed that will see a regionally consistent approach on the resetting and recovery of the disability services scaled back across Northern Ireland during the first surge. All trusts, in partnership with the independent sector providers, are developing detailed service-specific action plans informed by a range of factors, including COVID-19-related staff absences, the ability to implement social distancing measures within current facilities, the ability to return staff from redeployments, and local variation both in infection rates and practicalities. Engagement with carers and independent sector providers is already underway across all trusts in relation to these plans. It is important to recognise that there have been practical barriers to consultation with service users during this pandemic. However, we must ensure their views shape how services are reset and scaled up. Initial feedback suggests that flexibility will be essential as we enter into the recovery phase, reflecting a demand for increased creativity and approach to service delivery in light of experiences during the first surge. Incorporating the learning and new approaches developed in response to this pandemic will be central to our approach to restarting and indeed for the future shape of learning disability services in Northern Ireland. To that end, the lessons learned from COVID-19 must inform the ongoing development of the learning disability service model for Northern Ireland. In conclusion, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it is important to emphasise that our understanding of the impact of COVID-19 on our population is still a developing picture. Although the anecdotal evidence is clear and backed up by much of what has been said here today, we still have a lot to learn in particular about its impact on various groups here in Northern Ireland, including those with a disability and their families and carers. While I am confident that the detailed planning already underway reflects what we currently know, I am also fully committed to increasing our understanding of the impacts on children and adults with a disability and their families in order to inform our plans for rebuilding as they continue to evolve in line with the strategic framework I have already published and the principles of co-production 
which I am fully committed to as we move forward. We will also continue to work in partnership with our partners across all departments to ensure that the holistic needs of those with a disability and their families are met. On this basis, I support the motion today and I thank the members once again for bringing this important issue to the floor of the Assembly. But Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the last word must go to families. I want to assure you and your contribution to your response to this pandemic to date is much valued by me and my department. I salute your resilience and your incredible efforts to advocate on behalf of your loved ones. Because while we must recognise that the road ahead will be challenging, with service capacity likely continue, to continue to be significantly impact, impacted, it should not have to be a struggle for those who play such an important role in our system. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, we must keep striving to improve how we do things. As a system, I know we will rise to this challenge, and I look forward to doing this with everyone who has a stake in making it better for all. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I support this motion. Thank you, Minister. And the Minister went uh, a minute over, but given the, con of the content of that minute, uh, I think I, I did the right thing in not interrupting him. So I call Mr Colm Gildernew to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Mr Gildernew. Gorham Elgert, Prayer Lasky and Corlea. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and I, I am very pleased to be associated with this motion today, and I, I also want to acknowledge the work that Chris Little has done in bringing us all together on such an important issue. Members across the board have largely uh, recognised many of the groups who have engaged in, the, in, the, in, this, in this debate today from outside this chamber, um, and I know families involved who I did a significant Zoom meeting with a number of weeks ago have certainly been instrumental, as have a range of other groups. Um, and I have to say that, that I also noted in relation to the debate in the run into this, there was uh, an issue raised in relation to whether or not this would be tokenistic. And I have to say that I recognise that concern from this group of people. We all know that curers, in the best of times, are faced with very difficult situations. And that this COVID-19 crisis has indeed accelerated many of those issues, has left them further isolated, have le has left them with further difficulties in relation to holding down um, a job and, and trying to manage their caring role at the same time. And I think that is something that we need to be very conscious of. I would also have been delighted, I have to say, had this, had this motion included an element of uh, financial recognition in terms of the additional costs that curers have had in terms of PPE, in terms of having to pick up extra care. And I think that's something that we do need to look at very realistically. And I acknowledge the Minister's remarks in relation to looking at, looking at that issue very specifically. And I think it's something that would be important that we address in the time ahead as a priority. Speakers here today have also indicated the un fair, if you like, impact of curing on particular groups. And I think women, obviously, are the first group that come to mind in relation to that. But I would also have to say I would have concern for child carers who have had to deal with the issue of their schools being closed, all those, all those additional supports or respite disappearing from them. When I first came into this assembly, I uh, became spokesperson for Sinn Féin for curers um, and wellbeing. And the reason I asked for that role to be created was because I think there's a wide recognition that we too often leave curers to the very last as, as an afterthought in many ways. And we can't see that continue because, as has been acknowledged by the Minister and by other members speaking here today, the huge amount of people who are providing care in our society, the, the entire health and social care system relies heavily on the input that those, that those curers bring. And if we don't support them, and as Kelly Armstrong has said earlier, if they get worn out, we're in serious trouble. There's absolutely no question about that. So we need to engage with them in a very, very realistic way. And, and I acknowledge that the Minister's point today that there has been additional difficulties in terms of COVID-19. But I think there also have been additional opportunities opened up in relation to many of us have seen um, all party group meetings, and I, I attended one in particular. There was 80 people at a Zoom meeting. So there are other ways being opened up for engagement that I think should be explored very, very proactively. 
I also want to address today the issue of trust responsibilities in, in all of this. And the trusts have a very, very central responsibility. And in the first instance, I think the trusts have a responsibility, firstly, to identify carers. And I had done a piece of work with, with the trusts a, a number of months ago in relation to their register of carers. It's patchy, it's incomplete. They, they understand themselves that they do not fully uh, know who is, who is providing care out there in the community. And, and I think the minister has today acknowledged the additional carers that have been come forward at this time. And I think that's a significant piece of work and a welcome piece of work. But I think there's much more to be done in that respect. And I think we need to really find out who out there is caring and what it is we need to do to support them. Almost every speaker here today has acknowledged the fact that caring in itself and before COVID-19 has a huge impact on physical and mental health. Everyone has also acknowledged the impact of loneliness across the board on carers and the further, the further uh, difficulties with that uh, at this time. And there are significant issues around poverty. There's significant issues around um, career progression and the impact that, that it's having. And I actually believe that what we need to, to do longer term is we need to reinforce the rights of carers in legislation. The only legal right a carer has at this minute in time in our society is the right to an assessment. They don't even have the right that any needs identified within that assessment will be met, but at least it's a start if we're capturing, if we're capturing that unmet need. So I think we need to also look at the issue, and again, it's been mentioned by very many of our speakers today in relation to providing flexibility around direct payments and individual, individual budgets where that suits a particular situation. But we cannot overlook the essential need of core services which have been stopped. And I include within that the, 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 school, the schooling, um, but also the daycare, the respite, all of those core services which have been, and I mean, cures have now been stretched out for a number of weeks as referenced by some of our speakers. And they are, they are truly at the end of their tether in many cases, and I think we need to reflect. And I think, I, think, I, I do believe the minister understands that, and I do welcome the, the, uh, the, the moves that he has taken. But I think we need to, as a matter of urgency, see how we, we can take practical steps for the rebuilding of services. The minister has mentioned uh, difficulties with that, but I think those difficulties need to be um, engaged with very robustly to try to uh, prioritise it. it. It is one of the key things I think now that we're, we're looking at. So I just would like to commend everyone for the debate today. I think it's an important message to send out. While I recognise that, that people out there will be concerned that that this will, uh, this will be somehow tokenistic. I think it's very important that we at least start to have that debate and that we move the practical situation forward. So I would like to commend the motion to the House today. Thank you, Mr. Goldenew. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members, as I am moving the next motion, I am obviously unable to chair the debate on it, although some might think I would maybe try. Um, I have been advised that Deputy Speaker Beggs is unavailable and is therefore also unable to chair the debate.